Hi, I'm Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm. Well, I'm doing some work on my seeds tonight, and so I thought it might be a good time to make a video on how to grow roses from seed, both how to do it and what you can expect if you grow roses from seed. So getting right to it, this I harvested from my garden today, and it is a ripe uh, rose hip from Rosa rugosa alba. Um, you can see the orange color there. This indicates both by timing and by the color and look of the uh, and, and feel of the rose hips that it's a that it's a, a ripe rose hip. Also in the garden, you can have different types of rose hips. And from earlier, I also got this one here, which is from a Scots rose variety, and it darkens to black. Color doesn't make a difference. It's really about timing and softness when you harvest it, and that the the seeds inside are ready. So. Um, I'm going to show you on this one here how to get the seeds out. And this one you can just very easily break it apart. You can see there's a whole ton of different seeds in there. And uh, these ones are a pale tan color. These ones here were harvested a while back. And actually, the hips I dried. It doesn't matter. I just pulled them off the bush and put them on a counter somewhere and they dried out between the time I harvested them and now. So what I did is I just threw them in a glass of water You can see the tannins from the from the rose hips bleeding into the water. But that softens them up to the point where then I can break these open quite easily and see what's inside. And you can see on this one here, let's see what we found. Yeah, there's a nice beautiful seed in the center. And on this one here, it's got a dark brown seed covering. Same thing. Both are well should be perfectly viable seeds. Just these ones are tan and these ones were dark brown. Now once you have the seeds, the next step you have to do is you have to fool them. So roses are smart. They have this idea that if they ripened their fruit in one season, that if those fruits dropped to the ground and by some circumstance got buried or found favorable conditions in that first year, they do not want their seeds to germinate. The reason for that is because by that time, by the time the, the hips are ripe, the seeds, it's so late in the season that if the seeds germinated, they'd be going right into the winter season and they wouldn't survive. So they build in inhibitors to the seeds that stop them from germinating right away. In fact, what they need is they need to feel moisture and cold for a period of two to three months before they will go ahead and let those seedlings germinate. So for my purposes, what I do is I want to fool them. I take the seeds like this, and take off a bunch of the ripe ones here and you can clean them or wash them and that's fine and what I'll do is I'll get myself a little uh, Tupperware container or sealing container here and inside of it is moist vermiculite. Vermiculite is just a material that holds moisture and air and isn't likely to get waterlogged so that's why I use that and what I'll do with that is I'll take it into that container there and put a layer of seeds into the container, cover them up with some vermiculite. You can do that in something like this, or even in just a Ziploc bag like that, and then put them into the fridge. And the average temperatures in your fridge are appropriate, uh, you know, approximately, to show those seeds that they've gone through a winter period. And the timing you can expect, as mentioned, is about three months. So coming from right around now, end of October, that means my uh, stratification step, the putting them in the fridge step, will be done at the end of January, which is a bit early for me in my greenhouse conditions. I usually do this work somewhere mid-November, late November, so that mid-February or late February, that's when I can expect the seeds to be ready. And towards the end of the vernalization period in the fridge, you may look in here and find that the seeds have started to actually sprout which isn't great in the fridge because they don't get the light, they don't get the heat. Um, they'll actually suffer quite a lot in there and they'll stretch out. And by the time you put them into the ground, they probably won't be viable. Uh, so you want to catch that quickly. If you start to notice any number of seeds in that, uh, in that container starting to sprout, that's probably time to get them out of the fridge, get them into the greenhouse and, uh, and start uh, getting them into healthy seedlings. So now the next part of the question is, and this is actually the, more difficult, but maybe the more interesting part is what can you expect when you germinate these seeds from the garden? In the case of this one here, 
that's the Rosa Ragosa Elba I mentioned, what you're probably going to expect is something similar to the parent. Now, I can't say that safely because the bees do their work and they move pollen from plant to plant, but this plant here is slightly genetically incompatible with most of the garden roses I grow. So it's more likely to self-fertilize. The pollen from its own flowers gets transferred to its own flowers. That's viable and it, and it, and it uh, fertilizes it. And so now you have a seed where this plant is both parents. Or it's likely to, if it's in the garden with my other plants, crossbreed with another plant that's similar enough to it that it can still make viable offspring. Last year I did approximately 10 of these from Rosa rugosa alba. What I found was that seven of the 10 were white, just like the parent, and looked just like the parent, and acted just like the parent, and three of them were very, very similar, but they had pink flowers instead, just like Rosa rugosa, the, the straight species, or rubra. Um, and so that's what you would kind of expect uh, out of this plant. Now, you go to uh, complex garden roses, the bread car uh, garden roses, um, and it's a different story. With those ones there, they have really, really complex parentages. You can't expect that it was just a straight species anytime recent, uh, up into the, say, the grandparents or great grandparents of that rose. So let's say you took a rose like Wild Blue, Wild Blue Yonder, which is a great rose I grow it in my garden, uh, love it a lot, and I had it alone and let the bees do their thing, and uh, they uh, only pollinated it with itself. And I knew that. I still wouldn't expect that the offspring would be very much like the parent. It might have some similar characteristics, but out of 100 seedlings, you might not find one that's very close to Wild Blue Yonder. Um, and left alone in the garden with other roses that could easily crossbreed with it, because most of the, the modern bred roses will crossbreed with each other fairly easily. You know, it's like uh, playing the lottery, except that with a lottery ticket, you don't have to feed and water and prune and take care of the ticket for three years before you know whether you've won or not. So it's a bit of a commitment, it's a bit of a hobby, and you can see why rose breeders, I mean, it's a pretty serious thing. What they do is they, they improve their chances by choosing the parents and actually taking and transferring pollen from one to another. So they'll, they'll know the parentage, and they also have a trained eye, so they can figure out what they're looking for very quickly and look for cues in the health and, and growth habits of the seedlings as they progress. So they, it, it's quite a, a, quite a serious art and science that the breeders do. Uh, for a guy like me, who hasn't done a lot of breeding or any breeding at all, um, or for most gardeners, probably it's just a matter of a fun hobby. And then, of course, there's the chance that if you get an eye for it and a knack for it and you like doing it, then you can proceed into the hobby and start making uh, uh, determined crosses of your own for, for specific characteristics. And that's kind of a neat hobby. And there's actually a really uh, cool tradition of amateur rose breeders uh, contributing quite a lot to the, uh, to the advancement of, of modern roses. So, you know, I definitely wouldn't rule it out that you're gonna find something cool or that you're gonna work towards something cool. And this is the way you would do it, but for me, in practical terms, what I can do is I can use the species roses like this, uh, Rugosa and Rubrifolia and the Scots rose that aren't very genetically compatible with each other. I can plant the seedlings and I can have some fair confidence that the seedlings will be a lot like the parents and it's a good way for me to increase my roses um, and, uh, and have some fun doing it. So thank you so much for watching the video tonight and uh, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Thanks.